This is a sports catastrophe production. Hey there, hello there, hello there. It's Jeff Gunner Diamond welcoming me to a very special sports catastrophe video. And this video is about the legendary sports figures, or what I consider legendary sports figures, who died in 2021. Although it was not as great as 2020, there were still some legendary stars that died. Looking at this, every star person was in their 70s, uh, were at least in their 60s when they died. So these are guys who have lasted very long times, who, you know, are like father, like your father grew up watching them, and your grandfather, and all them. So, yeah, there's a lot different. You know, we didn't have like a Kobe Bryant in 2020 that he died before the age of 50, but like, yeah. I know there were some former stars of sports that actually were died before the age of 50, but I don't consider their careers being very decent and all that. I do apologize, though. But anyway, as you see in the photo, I came up with 18 famous names and all that. So anyway, um... First name on the list is from January 7th, Tommy Lasorda at 93 years old. Tommy Lasorda bled Dodger Blue. He was in the Dodger farm system for a few years. Legendary, he was legendary for being the guy who was cut from the Brooklyn Dodgers to make way for a young Sandy Colfax and sent to Montreal, which was the AAA affiliate, if you will, of the Dodgers. So Tommy Lasorda was a decent guy. He was a great third base coach for the Dodgers for many years. And then in 1976, he got the keys to the team as Walter Alston decided to retire. Lasorda would lead the Dodgers to World Series appearances in 77, 78, 81, 8, and 88, winning two titles, 81 and 88. Of course, 81 I'm a little bitter at because that was the matchup that saw the Dodgers beat the Expos on Blue Monday, but 1988 was a legendary performance for Tommy Lasorda. This Dodgers team wasn't even expected to get out of the NLCS, much less get to the World Series and win the World Series against the Oakland Athletics, who had Kinsanko, McGuire, Dave Stewart, and a lot of other prime players. The Dodgers, by proxy, had Kirk Gibson being their only main offensive threat. However, the Dodgers used the pitching of Earl Hershiser to win in five games. Lasorda stayed active in the Dodgers organization throughout some ceremony first pitches. His career as manager of the Dodgers can't be denied. Second is another Dodger legend, Don Sutton, who died January 19th at the age of 75, winning over 320 games. He would be legendary for what he did to the Dodgers and pitching well, 66 to 80. And then, you know, he would... Journey to Milwaukee helped the Brewers get to the 82 World Series against the Cardinals. He would help the uh, Oakland Athletics for a season. He would also help the California Angels try to get California into decent territory, but they failed. He pitched a few games for the 88 Dodgers, but retired before things got too bad. But Sutton was a star. For the ages. If I remember correctly, Don Sutton, wasn't he a broadcaster for the Braves as well? I think he was. The a color commentary for the Braves TBS stuff with Pete Van Wuren and, you know, Skip Carey. Anyway, three days later, baseball suffered another fatal blow, if you will. Hank Aaron, who died at age 86. Lots of people say Hank Aaron is the true home run king because he didn't take performance enhancing drugs like one Barry Bonds. But the fact of the matter is, Hank Aaron was an icon. He even played for the Braves when they were in Milwaukee. He almost played for the Braves when they were in Boston. Because people forget that the Braves were in Boston versus then Milwaukee, then Atlanta. But anyway, he was a Milwaukee Brave. He iconically hit a penny-winning home run in 1957 to get the Braves to the World Series against the New York Yankees. Of course, remember, in 1957, there was no LCS and all that. So you win the American League and National League, you win you go to the World Series. That would change in 69, but might digress. Hank Aaron was the star helping the Braves win the 57 World Series and almost got back-to-back -back titles as the 58 Braves choked that 3-1 series lead to the Yankees. However, Hank Aaron was a star for Milwaukee. 
And then the team moved to Atlanta. Of course, a lot of people were upset because Hank Aaron, you know, was a black player in the South trying to beat the record of a white legend by the name of Babe Ruth. However, despite all the death threats and all that, there were lots of positivity in all of that, especially when he hit number 715 at Atlanta Fulton County Stadium, April 8th, 1974, to break, no, 715 to break. Um, Babe Ruth's record and two white men actually ran onto the field and patted him on the back and all that. Two white fans. So that shows racial equality. Hank Aaron would actually end his career with the Milwaukee Brewers, if you can believe that. So he stayed in two cities, Milwaukee and Atlanta, all the time. And the funny thing is, the Braves won the World Series in his honor, I guess. Then January 24th, hockey suffered a big loss as George Armstrong, who's 90 years old, passed away. George Armstrong is actually known as the last Leaf captain to raise the cup, the last Leaf to raise the cup in 1967, as he had his son Brian help him with the cup, if you see the famous clips. But yeah, George Armstrong was legendary. He was a First Nations person, or indigenous, indigenous, and of course Canada having its own issues and finally realizing how bad um, these native schools are, I can't find the term right now, but anyway, these schools were trying to help natives get into white culture, but it failed miserably. Residential schools, of course. George Armstrong, thank God, didn't have to deal with that, but George Armstrong was a key component of the fact that First Nations people can play hockey and all that, like Fred Saskaboose and, uh, Sheldon K Sheldon Kennedy, and a few others. I can't remember who. I lost my weight. But anyway, George Armstrong was an icon stayed with at least all through his career for 20 years. He was an icon in Toronto colors. Uh, January 29th, the college basketball world lost John Cheney, who was, well, at age 89, but he was legendary. So over 740 wins, he was the head coach of Temple for many years. Didn't get Temple into the Final Four ever. Temple seemed to always come close in the 80s to get to the Final Four, but would choke at the last second. Obviously, Bill Cosby is a Temple alumnus and all that. I mean, he's an Ike on who knew John Cheney and all that. So, anyway, he held Temple out. Of course, he got in trouble in 94 when he basically charged after UMass coach John Calipari, or attempted to, because of some black, bad blood. And then in 2005, he was almost sacked from Temple because he sent some guy there to injure an opposing player and thug life. John Cheney was still was a key black college coach and would have an influence on people like Tubby Smith, Nolan Richardson, and a few others. I can't think of top of my head. Then February 8th, Marty Schoenheimer died at age 77. Schoenheimer was a great NFL coach in his career. He had good regular season success with Cleveland, Kansas City, San Diego, and a few crappy years with Washington. Other than that, he was it was just an average coach. He was good, but unfortunately his 5 and 13 playoff record will always haunt him, his legacy. Being a little too conservative sometimes in the playoffs cost him dearly. He, of course, was the head coach when Cleveland fell in 86 and 87. No, the 87 and 88, I should say, to the drive and the fumble. Uh, Kansas City had a few great chances to win a playoff game on home turf in like 95, 97, but things would ruin them. The Denver Broncos ruined them one year, and Lynn Elliott. The kicker ruined the Chiefs by missing three key field goals against the Indianapolis Colts that sent the Colts to the 95 AFC title game. Well, 95 96. But anyhow, Schottenheimer's conservativeness was a backdrop to his career. He was good in the regular season, but in the playoffs, he just choked. He's kind of like Marty Turco if you, in the NHL. Uh, next up on March 13th was Marvin Hagler, 66 years old. He was one of the best middleweight boxers of all time, if not the best middleweight boxer of all time. Marvelous Marvin Hangler took the title away from Alan Minter of Britain in 1980. It was a famous fight in London that actually caused a lot of trouble as 
there was a giant riot after Hagler beat Minter to win the title. It wasn't racism. It was just the fact that, you know, they took away a British title. Hagler would fight the middleweight belt and would have it for seven years, even beating Thomas Hitman Hearns for it in a famous 1985 fight. However, in 1987, he would lose to Sugar Ray Leonard on a controversial decision. But anyway, he was still an icon in the boxing world. <clears throat> and then March 22nd, three days later, Elgin Baylor passed away at age 86. He was a Lakers icon. He played for the Lakers when they were in their final stint in Minneapolis. The last two years that the Minneapolis Lakers were in Minneapolis and then the Lakers moved to Los Angeles. Elgin Baylor, the small forward from Seattle University, which doesn't play Division One basketball anymore. You do it. Elgin Baylor was a legend for the Lakers in the early days. In the 1960s, he would take shots. He would be a scoring machine. And, you know, he was the Laker of the 60s. Along with Jerry West, of course. But, you know, Elgin Baylor was good. And then no notable sports legend died till July 15th when Dennis Murphy died at age 94. Now, you're thinking, who the hell is this guy? Well, he's the guy who challenged the NBA and the NHL in Monopoly race. He wasn't, he wasn't part of baseball's attempt to try to um, get a second major league. And, you know... Uh, who else? And he wasn't part of the AFL that tried to challenge the NFL's things. But he challenged basketball and hockey with the American Basketball Association and the WHA, the World Hockey Association. No, the NBA was fine. And when it left in 1976, four teams were running. Indiana, Denver, the New York Nets that moved to New Jersey because of monopoly rights. And Indiana, did I say? San Antonio, Indiana, Denver, and New York. That team would move to New Jersey. Yeah. The ABA was good. At the right away blue ball, at the three point shots, ABA teams would do pretty well. It's the NBA in all star competitions. And, you know, Dr. J and David Thompson were ABA icons that came over to the NBA and did pretty well for themselves. I should say Dan Izzle, too, I think. Anyway, the WHA, of course, as a hockey fan, revolutionized how it was. The teams, like, moved house almost every year, and there weren't that many. However, it scared the NHL to take four of the teams in 1979. Edmonton, Quebec, which is now Colorado, Winnipeg, which is now Arizona, and Hartford, which is now Carolina. So, yeah, it brought WHA legends like Mark Messier playing in the WHA, Wayne Gretzky, uh... Bobby Hall was in the WHA. He basically is signing actually dropped dropped the ball jump to drop the ball on the NHL. And many other stars went to the WHA. Some like Paul Henderson and Normie Allman would actually go from and Dave Keela went from NHL to WHA because of interference from one Harold Fowler. Fuck him. Anyway, August 8th, Bobby Bowden died at age 91, just a month before the football season started. Bobby Bowden is remembered as being head coach of Florida State. Although he was with West Virginia for five years, he was Florida State personified. Florida State wasn't really that great of a football program, but he made Florida State respectable, especially in the mid-80s and 90s and the early 2000s. He was just a legend. Coaching FSU icons such as um, I would say Deion Sanders. I think it was Deion. Yeah, Deion Sanders, uh, Peter Warwick, Chris Wanky, Charlie Ward, uh, but, uh, Peter Bowler, uh, Audrey Wadsworth, you know, a lot of legends. He's second all-time in NCAA coaching wins behind Joe Paterno. So, yeah, FSU became more respectful as a university under his watch. And then September, no, sorry, August 10th was Tony Esposito's death at age 78. 
He was an iconic goalie for the Chicago Blackhawks. Number 35 retired. He set the rookie record for shutouts in the season with 15. In 1970, he was named Mr. O. He helped the Blackhawks do well in the 70s and early 80s. Although, no Stanley Cup. No Stan well, 71 and 73, he went to the Stanley Cup Finals. Ironically, it was against the team that he used to play for, Montreal. <clears throat> Confused? Well, here's the thing about Tony Esposito. He played 13 games as a member of the 1968-69 Montreal Canadiens. And even won a Stanley Cup, even though he didn't play in the Finals. Then Chicago drafted him in the intra-league draft, basically to make, if you're unprotected by a team, then other teams can pick you up. So Chicago picked him up as a goalie, and he didn't step back. Esposito was Chicago personified. And then, August 15th, Gerd Müller died at age 75. He was a star German striker. He actually was a bit pudgy and all that, and the German coach said, what am I supposed to do with a shot putter on my squad? But his striking abilities were great. He was named the Mama. And he helped Germany win the 1974 World Cup on home turf against the Dutch. Thanks to his goal scoring mark, he actually had 14 World Cup goals, which actually was the gold standard until one Ronaldo broke that. Not Cristiano Ronaldo, the Brazilian Ronaldo for that mark. So, that was huge for Gerd Muller, helping the West Germans out and all that. And he was a star instructor for Bayern Munich. In fact, his goal scoring record was only surpassed last year by Robert Lewandowski. So, yeah, that was huge. And then, four days after that, on August 19th, Rod Bear passed away at the age of 80. He was a Rangers icon in the 1960s and 70s. But few people forgot, remember, that his career almost got destroyed because of a junior hockey incident in Guelph when a fan had it discarded an ice cream container lid on the ice and Roger about slipped on it and then he ruined his spine and his leg. He almost had amputation and all that. But he had two major surgeries. One of them, spinal fusion surgery in the mid-60s after he saved his career. It was part of the gag line, the goal of the game line with uh, oh boy. Vic Hatfield and geez, Javert uh, I think it was Sean Rattel. Yeah, and Sean Rattel. So, anyway, Roger Bear was a star player for the Rangers. Even though the Rangers didn't really have much success in the 70s, even though they went to the 72 Stanley Cup Finals. Javert was great. The first Ranger to have his number retired, which was number seven. I thought the Rangers retired number three for Harry Howe, but I guess not. Not yet at the time. But Roger Bear was just iconic. And then, not too many major... Sports stars died until uh, November when we had Frank Williams. No, sorry. I'm ahead of myself. Um, November 6th was when Angela Mosca died. King Kong Mosca, age 84. If you're a CFL fan like I am, then you know that with the Hamilton Tiger Cats, he was just the greatest Tiger Cat around in the CFL. He helped Hamilton do well. In the, from 1962 to 1972, he was a Hamilton Tiger Cat. He, of course, got in trouble because of his illegal hit on Joe Fleming of the BC Lions in the Grey Cup 63, which kind of was a late hit and ruined BC's chances to win the Grey Cup over Hamilton. It was just huge. Mosca actually was a wrestler in the WWF back in the 19, late 70s, early 80s, basically being a heel. Unless he was in Toronto, then he was a face. But Mosca was a decent wrestler. Too. But anyway, Angelo Mosca did well for Hamilton and all that. Even won the Great Cup in 72 when he retired. So that was a good retirement present. Of course, a lot of modern people will know about Angelo Mosca because of his fight at a Great Cup banquet in 2013, 50 years after his legal hit, when he and Joe Cap, who was quarterback at BC at the time, actually had some pleasantries and basically. They actually fought. They both were invited to be on Dr. Phil, though, too. It was funny to see them be a social media hit for all the wrong reasons, I guess. 
But anyway, November 29th was when Frank Williams died at age 79. Who the hell is Frank Williams, you ask? Well, if you're an F1 fan, you, you're basically breaking up the wrong tree. They'll beat the shit out of you. But regardless of that, Frank Williams helped create Williams Racing and actually got seven driver's titles under his watch, all won by seven different people, which was funny enough. He won in 1980 with Alan Jones. He won, he won title in 1982 with Kiki Rosberg, you know, Nico Rosberg's um, dad. In 87 with Nelson Piquet. 92 with Nigel Mansell, the British icon. 93 with Alain Prost before he decided to leave at one forever. 96 with Damon Hill. The iconic Damon Hill. And then 97 when Jacques Villeneuve took the title for Williams, being the only Canadian to win an F1 title. And I think the only F only Canadian F1 driver to win a race, if my memory serves me right. And the funny thing about Villeneuve is he almost won the, the title in 96, but he was fighting his teammate Damon Hill for it. So yeah, Frank Williams was an icon. He brought seven world title holders and all that. And then December 9th, the auto racing world lost another one as Al Unser Sr. died at age 82. A four-time Indy 500 champion. It's rare to see someone win four Indy 500s. Indy 500s are, is one of the greatest races of all time. But Al Unser Sr. won it in 70, 71, 78, and 87. Man, his longevity was huge. 17 years between his first and last Indy 500 tournament. But he did it. He spawned his son, Al Unser Jr., who won the 92 race in the closest finish in Indy 500 history still to this day. I think still to this day is the 92 finish between Unser Jr. and Goodyear. But yeah, Al Unser Sr. was a great driver. Two-time world, two-time IndyCar champion in that. And, you know, the four-time champions. I mean, who else is a four-time champion? All I can think of is Rick Mears... Julio Castro Neves, and I feel like it's Johnny Rutherford. Can't remember the other name, but regardless. Uh, December 28th, John Madden passed away. So this is being taped, of course, on New Year's Day 2022. But the funny thing is, on Tuesday, the 28th, John Madden passed away at age 85. He coached Oakland throughout the 60s and 70s, well, from 69 to 70. Eight. He retired after winning Super Bowl eleven. Oh no, wait. Eight. I think it was. I think he retired a year after Super Bowl eleven. But yeah, he got the Raiders to Super Bowl in nineteen seventy seven against the Vikings. It wasn't even close. But yeah, Oakland always did well with him. Of course, Oakland was always prone to controversies. While he was the starter, you know, the Mac, the coach, Macklin reception, the fumble in the AFC title game against Denver that cost the Raiders a chance to the to go to the Super Bowl. Yeah. Madden was there. He was a great coach. Al Davis liked him. Madden, after he left coaching, decided to be a color commentator. And his telestrator was always iconic and all that. And he broadcast games for all four major um, American networks for football. He started out CBS with Pat Summerall when CBS had the NFC games for many years, and then once CBS lost rights to Fox for the NFC games, Madden jumped ship to Fox, alongside Pat Summerall, and brought Fox some respectability, and then after, I guess after 2002 or something like that, yeah, after 2002, he decides to jump ship to ABC and do Monday Night Football with Al Michaels, and then after a few years, he jumped to NBC to do Games with Al Michaels. So, yeah, he was color commentator on all four major networks. That's hard to believe, but, yeah, he did. And, of course, who can forget about his legacy in the video game world, as Madden Football was one of the best and should be one of the best franchises in history. Unfortunately, though, you know, it's gone downhill for a while. And as someone who at one time, well, not consecutively, but one time, but throughout my video game career have owned nine different Madden copies. I actually currently possess Madden 99 for the PS1, Madden 03, 05, and 11 
for the PS2 and Madden 25th anniversary for PS3. I know what Madden's like and all that, and it's great to see John Madden, you know, endorse a video game, and it took off like a rocket. So yeah, great job. And finally, just yesterday, December 31st of 2021, Sam Jones died at age 88. You're thinking, that's a generic name. You're right. However, the, the basketball player who took those shoes was an icon. Sam freaking Jones won 10 titles in the NBA. That's second to Bill Russell for most NBA titles by a player. And, of course, Sam Jones was part of the great Boston dynasty that won eight in a row from 59 and 66. And he won back to back in 68 and 69. So Boston won 10 times in 11 years. That's iconic. And you think the Patriots were are dominant. I mean, Frick, Patriots only won six titles in their lifetime, and it's been like 20 years, six times in 20 years. Boston won 10 in 11 years. Think about that. I know that other people said, oh, there weren't too many teams back in the 60s. Correct. That's true. That is actually true. But, I mean, when you got opponents like Will Chamberlain, Elgin Baylor, and Jerry West, I mean, Boston just had to be lucky to be good sometimes. But yeah, Sam Jones is number 24, retired by the boat, by the Celtics, 10-time champion, a legend in his own right. What can you say? He was good. Fight me on it. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Diamond. Adieu.